What can you say other than, uh, as they, EJ likes to say, Steffertless? With the nine three-pointers record, there was so much question, Bones, about his injury and health and the rust and when it was going to wear off. And then all of a sudden we snapped a finger and Steph has gone to being the best player on the Warriors team through two games in the series. Well, I think Steve Kerr had a game plan about you know, Steph returning from this injury and making sure that two things happen. One is that Steph would regain his confidence. That's first and foremost. And then secondly, the team around Steph understood how confident they needed to play in the wake of the injury to him. In the Houston series, it was a sort of a progressive thing. I think Steve Kerr talked to Steph a lot about trying to keep the game as simple as possible. There have been times in Steph Curry's career in big games where he's gotten really excitable and tried to make huge plays, you know, over the shoulder passes, behind the back drop passes and things of that nature that he tried to avoid in the Houston series. One, to, to make sure there's no turnovers and to start feeling deflated, uh, but to help his team have more possessions to win a basketball game. That time has passed. We're in the finals now. And through two games, Steph has been remarkable. I feel bad for Jetty Osman. The, the record-setting three is against him. After he made eight threes, Ty <laughs> says, Jetty, go guard him. That's not cool, by the way. Um, but Steph has been remarkable and uh, took that game over with uh, some curry flurries at Oracle. We've got our own David Aldridge down on the floor as the Cavs are getting ready on their side. DA, I remember the interview you did with at that time sixth man of the year, Steph, after the one game he came <laughs> off of the bench. Uh, <laughs> he hasn't shown much rust since then. How about how quickly we, we've seen ankles be an issue now on this team with a couple of players, how quickly he's been able to come back and look like Steph form. Well, it took him a, a, a couple of series. I mean, he came back in the middle of the New Orleans series and, and was a little rusty. The first game, he, he played great with the adrenaline. And then the next two or three games of that series, he really kind of struggled a little bit. But I think getting through that series uh, helped. And I think I'd say about midway through the Houston series, he really started to look like himself again and has carried that throughout the last you know, four or five games that the Warriors have played. Certainly, uh, the first two games of the finals, he looks like the Steph Curry of old, completely healthy. He has said throughout this that his knee was fine. He has continued to maintain that once he came back, his knee was fine. But I do think the timing, the rust, some of those things did take a while for him to get through. I think the other part that's interesting, D.A., is the fact that the opponents that you play sometimes – can impact how it is that a coaching staff is going to view your return to the floor. Mm -hmm. So for Steph to come back against the, the uh, uber-fast, high-paced, high-octane offense of, of New Orleans was something that they were cautious of. But I think that helped him when it came to the Houston series where it was going to be down to isolation play. And so it, that has helped him settle in. The opponents sometimes can impact how your confidence grows with what you can do, how you can yeah. do it, and when you can do it. No question. No question. And the, the New Orleans series was kind of, you know, it was kind of an outlier because Durant had such a physical advantage over the Pelicans defenders. I mean, actually, I thought Drew Holiday was the best guy, the best defender against him. But for the most part, Durant, it was like shooting over a chair. I mean, he could just get whatever shot he wanted. It was hard not to go to that matchup. It was also hard not to play at the pace that the Pelicans wanted to play at because that's the pace the Warriors like to play at. So you're exactly right. Once the series slowed down, I do think the first two or three games against Houston, it took the whole team a while to figure out with the switching off the ball on the weak side, especially Bones. They yep. just really, it really discombobulated them for a while. Now, they grounded out and they figured it out as the series went on, but it did take them a few games to figure it out. DA, there's no question if anybody underrated the importance of Andre Iguodala before the playoffs, they're not now, yeah. which makes it even scarier that it's a 2 to nothing lead in this series anyway. What's the status on Iggy and where we stand with him? Well, right now, I, you know, I still don't know if Game 3 is a possibility for him. He is starting to shoot. That's important because he hadn't been doing that until very recent last couple of days and doing some things on the floor he had not been able to do uh, previously. Now, that doesn't mean he's playing in game three. I'm not sure we're there yet, and we'll hear what Steve Kerr has to say in a bit on that. Um, but I think the confidence level is that at some point, if this series gets to game six and seven, you'll see Iguodala back on the floor. But make no mistake, it was a bone bruise, and, you know, 3D and bones, you guys know this better than anybody. When you have a bone bruise, it's there until it's not there. And then you wake up one morning and it's not there anymore and you're good to go. But until then, you're not. And so that's where Iguodala still is. 
DA, appreciate it. Thank you. We'll check in with you later in the show. Thanks. Sure. All right, David Aldridge down on the floor. Let's get to the matchup. I, I wanted to say so. I feel Go like ahead. Yeah. DA said, you know, the bone bruise is there it's, until it's not there. That's how Dennis is if he comes out to Los Angeles in the summer and stays at my house. Yeah. He's there until he's not until there. Until he's not yeah, there. I, I wish that he would understand that a little bit. Well, if better. you remind people where you live in Los Angeles, not, yeah. nobody would want to stay in your house. Yeah, that, yeah, it's true. It's, you know, Manhattan Beach. True. You want to give the address? No, you just right, gave so too much away. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's talk about, regardless of where Steph has been located, it's been a problem. But yeah. Kevin Love and that matchup we've watched a lot, and it's almost like you struggle for him with how much he's trying to be impactful defensively yet having a problem. What are you seeing with Love? I'm, I'm wondering Love? If, uh, if Steph is attacking the Kev Love match, matchup in terms of the switching because of a couple years ago when, when Steph got shut down on one big play. There was a lot of talk about that one big play, and Steph's made several big ones so far in this series. And it, it's there will be a lot of chatter about this in the next – you know, 48 hours leading up to the game about how often do you want to give up this quick switch and be at a disadvantage to start the possession. Here's just an incredible job of step on a relocation. Once he gets the defender moving, your tendency after a pass is to relax, and then Steph goes back out to the three-point line. And most big guys, Casey, obviously they're, they're conditioned to play a certain way against their given matchup that you would start to gravitate towards the lane. You would start to work into rebound position. You want to put a body on somebody to end the possession with a rebound. But if you're Kevin Love and you're playing Steph Curry, that, that's not an option. Your option is to get to Steph as quick as possible. He's going to create space by moving without the ball. He's going to set screens away from the ball. They're sometimes going to set picks in order to get the easy switch. And Kevin Love guarded Steph Curry more than any other Cavalier in game two. That is, that is not a recipe for success. So the, the interesting thing for Ty Lue is how are they going to combat that? Is it going to be a trap until Steph gets away from the ball? Or are we going to fight through the initial screen a couple of times so we're just not giving up that disadvantage with so much time on the clock and so much room for Steph Curry to operate?